my name is Nick and welcome to Nick's Picks Watch Reviews, the YouTube channel where we look at watches that I would pick, I might pick, or I have picked. And today we're going to be looking at a watch that I have in fact picked, the Omega Seamaster Professional 300M in white. Yes, in white. Now, I didn't go into the store trying to buy it in white. I was actually looking for the blue and then I saw the white and it caught my eye and I said, it's got to be that one. Uh, I also saw it in black and it wasn't actually an immediate choice. I was kind of waffling between them. I was like, okay, well, blue is what Bond wore, but he also wore a quartz version and this isn't quartz. So I've already deviated from what it was. Uh, and black looks really classy. It has that high polished dial, high polished bezel. It just looks, oh, looks great. Um, but then there's the white. It just kind of pops and it looks more sporty. It feels like I could wear it in a few more contexts than I would actually be in. Uh, don't wear a suit and tie as much. And uh, I ended up with the white. I also ended up putting it on a NATO. I think that is the best way to wear this watch is on a NATO strap. Now, I will say that the bracelet is fantastic. We'll be talking about the bracelet a little bit later. I actually have some pros and cons there. Um, but the NATO, it just, you know, you forget you're wearing it. It's so comfortable. You can adjust it to any size you want, and it still looks fantastic. I paired it with the Bond style NATO, the official one from Omega, which is kind of interesting because if you actually watch the DVDs or Blu-rays that actually have high enough definition to see it, he's not wearing this style of NATO originally. Uh, if you go back to, you know, where this style originated, it was from the older films, not starring Brosnan, not starring Daniel Craig, not with an Omega at all. It was with a Rolex Submariner 6538, and it was on a NATO that actually had nine stripes on it. It was slightly different colors than this, but this one actually does work well. I think it works well with the, the black and white of the dial. I think it uh, works well with the overall aesthetic. And uh, again, it's something that is comfortable and I wear it every day. And the quality of this NATO uh, that uh, that Omega produces is actually very nice. It's, it's top quality. It doesn't have any fraying at this point. Uh, and I've worn it a lot. Uh, it's been in all contexts, wet, dry, underwater, in every kind of water, chlorinated, regular water, well water. I say regular water, you know, what you get from a tap typically. Uh, and it's also been in the ocean. So it has experienced a life at this point, and it's fine. There's no fading. There's no fraying. Uh, so I got to give them props for that. I wasn't really expecting that out of a, a factory NATO, although maybe I should. Maybe I'm saying, you know, the, the things that uh, are irrational at this point. But I think this is the way to wear it, and uh, I do appreciate its connection with Bond. I know that that is a common theme throughout my reviews and probably annoying for some. But anyway, let's go ahead and dig into the specifications of this watch and then see what's great about this watch and what are some of the pain points that you might discover after you bring it home, after you buy it, after you wear it a little bit. All right, here we go. We're getting down to it with specifications on yet another 42 millimeter diver that is right on my edge of comfort. I like to have it between 38 millimeters and 42, and this is right on that edge. But it has a respectable lug to lug at 49.6 millimeters, and it has the perfect lug width of 20 millimeters for being able to wear it on any strap or bracelet you can imagine. Comes in with a thickness at 13.8 millimeters, which is a little bit tall. It's a little bit thick for me, but it can still just, you know, slide under the cuff a little bit. If you pull up on the cuff so it can get under there, especially when it's worn on a NATO here at 16.6 millimeters, it is stainless steel. It is a steel stunner with sapphire crystal and sapphire case back. Of course, it is a steel and sapphire case back as you look at it. But uh, the one thing I will say about the sapphire crystal is it is AR coated, thickly AR coated with a kind of weaker AR coating. And we'll get to that later. In terms of the movement, it's powered by an Omega 8800 coaxial that is beating at 25,200 vibrations per hour. And yes, you heard that right. It is a very strange beat rate, but it can eke out 55 hours of power reserve from that. As a dive watch, it's no surprise that this has 30 bar or 300 meters of water resistance, and it has loom with different colors for the hour hand and minute hand so you can see kind of what's going on. All right, you might be watching this saying, but if I buy this watch, it's going to be not on this NATO. I'm going to have to go buy this NATO separately, and it's kind of expensive to buy this separately straight from Omega. So, you know, what is the bracelet like? What if I just wanted to wear it on a bracelet? Well, the bracelet's actually pretty good. I, I don't really have a lot against the bracelet. In fact, if we look at the clasp, the clasp is exceptional. Uh, it's a push-button milled clasp. As you open it up, you have this uh, 
push uh, button that you can press to slide the uh, the size of it. So you can actually um, you know quickly adjust the size of it as you're wearing it throughout the day. And if that's not enough, you also still have a dive extension. And uh, you know if you look at the dive extension, it it gives you a lot of extension. Uh, however, it does change the the look of the watch, right? You look at it, um, and uh, it doesn't look as I don't know, it doesn't look as put together as it does with the dive extension, not extended, uh, and just uh, kind of slid out. And even the slid out part doesn't quite look like it's uh, yet another link. It looks like it, it it's extended. It looks like it's a uh, an extension that's fully extended. So if you feel a little self-conscious about that, you're like, I don't want to be the guy where you can see that I've had to make my watch bigger. Too bad. <laughs> that's what it's going to be for this one. All right. So if the clasp is all rainbows and butterflies, why don't I have it on? Why am I not wearing it on the bracelet? Well, I, I appreciate the bracelet, right? I appreciate the finishing that they have considered the fact that I might want a little bit of reflection, but I don't want to have polished center links where they're going to get scuffed up like crazy. I'm going to have maybe nine links in there, maybe seven, maybe five. I don't really know how many there are. It kind of goes from brushed to polished to brushed to polished to brushed to polished to brushed to polished to brushed again. But those segments that kind of have the three finishes or I guess the three different pieces, I don't know if those are actually three different pieces or if it's one piece that's pretending to be three. Either way, uh, you know, it's a really complex bracelet design. I appreciate what they've done there, but it doesn't taper. It's just straight blocky and it, it feels kind of heavy. I feel like something's strangling me on my wrist when I'm wearing it. I know that you might love the bracelet. It's just not for me. All right. So I, I wear it on the NATO. The NATO is fantastic. And one of the things you won't notice when you're wearing it on the wrist, but is actually critical and a huge part of this watch's story is the movement. Uh, you'll find that it is really highly decorated for what it is. It's trying to be a tool watch. In fact, if we look at the uh, the stats on in terms of its uh, anti-magnetism and, and all of that stuff, we're going to be really impressed with that from a technological standpoint. And then you turn it around and you look at it because it has a display case back. And you'll notice that there's decoration here that is very well executed as well. You have Cote de Genève, you have Englage. You have uh, all these beveled surfaces. You have, uh, even inside of the barrel, the mainspring barrel, you have DLC coating. Now, that's not necessarily for decoration uh, so much as it is for, uh, you know, reducing the friction inside of that and, and increasing the service intervals. And that is a pretty big focus of this movement. Uh, but it is a very well done watch, very well done movement. And that movement features the coaxial escapement. Omega invested heavily in bringing the coaxial escapement to the market. It's now become the signature feature of the brand's in-house movements. It came some 250 years after the creation of the Swiss lever escapement and improves on the design by taking the pallet fork, which would typically have two stones which slide over the teeth of the escape wheel, and forming it so it has three instead. Essentially, it's trading sliding friction for radial friction at the impulse surfaces, simultaneously eliminating the need to lubricate the pallets, improving accuracy, and increasing intervals between services. It advances the technology forward after 250 years of tradition without completely throwing away the soul of the watch. It's still a beautiful time-telling machine. Now, the coaxial escapement is just the beginning of the technology that's packed into this movement. It's also rated to withstand 15,000 Gauss of magnetism. That's 15 times what the Rolex Milgauss claims to be able to handle in its name. And we actually have proof of that for each example you buy. In fact, in the case of this example, it came with a little folio with the um, box that contained three cards in it. One of them being the warranty card. One of them being the master chronometer certification and one being pictograms. Not, not really sure what that last one's about, actually. It has a bunch of pictures on the back, I guess, that show all the, you know, features and capabilities of this. But uh, that, that master chronometer certification card actually has information on it that you can use to look up your specific watch's tests from the Omega website. Now, in the case of my watch, I actually looked it up. And the certificate demonstrated that it did pass all of the tests, which I'm actually very glad that it did. Otherwise, I'd be concerned as to why it shipped. But um, it, it passed with flying colors. In terms of accuracy, 
um, what they do is they actually do test, uh, you know, they do the cost certification of just the movement um, before casing. They actually then case the movement, build the watch, and they test the watch as a whole. And uh, they test it for accuracy, or I should say uh, precision, rather. Um, and then they actually go and then they subject it to things like magnetism and see how does that precision deviate from the original scores. And then from there, they, they uh, figure out as well, what is the average daily preci uh, precision? What is the precision in multiple uh, positions? And there's different ranges of precision that are uh, allowed for in all of those tests. In my case, it's actually running really true to the test results. So that was very encouraging uh, to be able to see exactly what to expect out of my watch and, and be able to then, uh, you know, see it deliver that. It's also nice to know that I'm also probably going to see delivered the results of the other tests that I'm not trying to subject my watch to. I don't intend to subject it to 15,000 gauss of magnetism, although that could happen, uh, or, you know, 5,000 Gs of shock or something else. Now, turning attention to the dial, this dial is very well executed with zirconium oxide ceramic and a laser etched pattern. Uh, this laser etched wave pattern is actually reminiscent of the earlier references in the series and a nice nod to uh, nice nod to the one that Bond was wearing as well. Got to get another James Bond reference in there. Um, now, beyond that, the indices, the applied indices are tall. They add amazing depth to the dial. Uh, if you view it from the side, it looks like a little city in there. I don't know. It just looks so cool, especially if you hit it with a little bit of UV torch so you get a little loom action going on. It's incredible. Love it. Now, I can't say I have the same love for the AR coating on the Sapphire Crystal. It is not the same hardness as the Sapphire at all. Not even close. In fact, I wonder if they just took Hesalite. They just kind of melted it onto the Sapphire Crystal and they're like, yeah, figure things out. Um, but you know, it's it's not something that even Polywatch is going to do much for you on unless you just wipe it all off, just scrub it all off. But anyway, it's it's it doesn't hold up to wear. Uh, I was watching uh, Adrian's review from Bark and Jack uh, shortly after I purchased this watch, and um, yeah, I saw that in that review, and I was I was thinking, you know, come on, that's that's a little bit much that you're complaining about that. That's not really going to be that bad. It's that bad. It really is. Uh, so I actually have some macro shots where I was able to capture it and I have no macro shots where I was not able to capture it because it showed up in all of them. Uh, even where I thought it was a little bit of dirt or dust. No, that was a scratch in the AR coating yet again. And I actually saw this even without the macro lens. I can see it with my naked eyes when they're naked like this, not clothed. And, um, when I see it with my naked eyes, it, it kind of looks like well, it looks like I'm not wearing my glasses. It looks kind of blurry over the logo. And uh, as you wear it, you're going to accumulate these scratches. And um, at some point, I might investigate, might investigate what it might look like to not have that coating. And that's all I'll say for now on that. And I love the fact that my watch is under warranty at the moment. All right. So let's talk about something good, though. The bezel. The bezel is beautiful. They have switched over to ceramic in previous references. Uh, you would have had the aluminum bezel. Uh, this ceramic bezel has a very satisfying click. Yes, I have bezel clicks for you today. Here we go. Very nice. Um, but what I will say is that even though that looked easy, because it, it was it was actually pretty easy. I just kind of turned it like that and it worked. Uh, this is not easy if your fingers are wet. It's almost as if when you make your fingers wet, the bezel is locked into place. And maybe that's by design. Maybe it's so that right as you go down into the water to dive, you can, you know, set the time to when you're going down. And then you go down into the water, you dive, and then you can't accidentally or intentionally change the time. So even if someone is like, you know, trying to mess with you and sabotage and kill you, I guess that would be horrible. You know, and they reach over, they're like, well, I'm going to get this guy. I'm just going to turn his dive bezel. Uh, no, it's not going to happen because pretty much you can't do it when your hands are wet or with gloves. And I'm sorry, five people on the forums that yelled at that one guy that said that you couldn't. He was right. He was right. And I didn't stand up for him because I didn't want to log in because that takes too much time. 
poor guy. Feel bad for that guy. I got to track that guy down. But no, the uh, bezel operating that with wet hands, not a thing. You, you could say, well, you just need to press harder down or, you know, you need to, do you even lift? Like, what are you doing? Uh, yes, no. So you can't, no, you can press further down and you still look like a, like a dumb dumb when you're trying to do that. It doesn't work with wet hands. I know that you're going to probably post a video response with you with wet hands doing it. And that's great. You can open my jar of peanut butter next time. This with wet hands is not a pleasant experience. All right. So with dry hands, perfectly fine. Great bezel action. Wet hands. Ugh. Try to do that. Okay. Well, it worked a few times and then I, I guess they're not wet enough. And that was really gross. That's like not okay. You know, I just created COVID-22. So that's probably not a great thing. All right. So the bezel, you know, control might not be awesome, but also the loom on the bezel isn't awesome because I know that it could be awesome and they're holding back on us. They have done a fully loomed bezel in the no time to die edition. Please, please Omega bring that into the regular standard edition. I know that the regular standard edition is basically special editions because there's a million special editions available of it all the time, but but really the regular one that's always there, you know, the one that's not like, okay, I know the special editions are also always there, but like the one that you can buy when you're not getting one that says special edition. I want that one to have bezel loom. I want it to be loomed like, you know, like the, the special edition James Bond one. I think that one looks awesome, but I would love to have that on this one. I'd love to have it on the, the blue dial one. Uh, I just want bezel loom. I think that would be amazing. The rest of the loom story is really good. The, the rest of the loom, it has super loom and over loom, and it looks incredible. So uh, I can't complain about the loom beyond the fact that it's not on the bezel. And that's not really a complaint. That's just me begging Omega, please do it because I know you can, and it looks great when you do. Um, but the loom, it, it has great staying power, great brightness, and even different color for the hour and minute hand to be able to keep track of them. Although what I will say about that is, you know, as I'm wearing it at night, uh, I'm not wearing my glasses and waking up in the middle of the night, trying to figure out what time it is, trying to see, you know, do I need to wake up soon? And usually what I do is if, if I have a timing bezel, I'll like move the timing bezel to, you know, what hour I'm going to wake up. And I'm just trying to see, is the hour hand pointing at that? And the way that they've skeletonized the hands and the way that they've loomed them and with my eyesight all combined, I can't figure out what time it is <laughs> because I'm seeing like triple vision of these skeletonized glowing hands and it's not like at that hour I can comprehend like, okay, the blue one means hours or days. I, you know, I, I don't get it at that hour. Like I'm literally just trying to see is the shorthand lining up with the dot. You know, that's the level of comprehension my brain has at like 3 a.m. in the morning. And so, uh, you know, I want to be able to do that. And uh, currently with the, the handset, how it's set up, I can't. The loom though is great. It's just if they hadn't skeletonized the hands, it would be better, uh, in my opinion. And if they loom the bezel, it would be better. Again, in my opinion, those are all my opinions there. And uh, you can take it or leave it. Now, the last point about this watch before we wrap up that I want to call out is the helium escape valve. So as we look at it, it has this asymmetry about it, right? It, it has just something a little bit off. And it's not the bezel that I put in like one click away from center. Uh, it's the helium escape valve. That's kind of hanging out there at the 10. It just doesn't look right. Unless you're saying, no, oh, I love the helium escape valve. I need that for my saturation dives. Sometimes I'm at my desk and then I have to go do a saturation dive and that serves me well. That's not me. I actually have never done that. Um, so for me, that's not a helpful complication to have. If I do have it, I want it to be well integrated into the watch design. I don't want it to be sticking out as a separate crown. And I'm almost curious, like, okay, so why do I need that separate crown? No, again, I'm not a saturation diver. I'm just never going to use it. And uh, with the asymmetry there, it, it just doesn't feel right. They don't offer me an option for like the, you know, I'm just going to dive in my bathtub edition. Uh, you know, I want that one. I want the, you know, I'm not going on this serious saturation dive. I'll, I'll ditch that crown. I still want the shock resistance, the anti-magnetism, the high decorated movement. I still want the coaxial escapement with the longer service intervals. I still want the classy look. I still want the ceramic bezel, ceramic dial. I still want all of that stuff. They can keep the bracelet. I'll take the NATO. But I don't need the helium escape valve in my life. I, I don't. And you probably don't either, unless you do. If you do, put it in the comments. Be like, I'm a saturation diver and I actually do use that and you're a moron. Put that in the comments. I will accept it. 
Unless you're lying. I don't accept liars that say such things. All right, that's it for this week. Uh, we'll see you next time on Nick's Picks Watch Reviews. And uh, I really just want to thank all the viewers out there, all five of you, uh, like I said, including my mom, uh, that uh, tune in on a weekly basis. I will say this. I know that there are 80% of you out there that are not currently subscribed. Please subscribe. It would mean a lot to me. Uh, this channel actually gets monetized. If I can reach it to 1,000 subscribers, I can actually make some money. It could be like I make like five cents or something like that, maybe even 10 cents on an episode. And uh, that might actually begin to pay for uh, the water, the copious amounts of water that I drink while I'm filming these episodes. And, uh, you know, that would be amazing. Uh, so if you want to uh, subscribe, do that. Give this video a like, and uh, we will see you next time. If you like this episode, please be sure to subscribe to both this channel and the About Time channel, give this video a like, and hit that notification bell to be notified about future episodes.